welcome to Kristen Lindy. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Every good, effective leader begins with the disciplining of his or her thoughts. And that's why we give leadership that definition. It begins with our thinking. And when we leaders are able to discipline our thoughts, whether it's at work, or at home, or in the community, we're able to practice a marvelous idea called personal accountability. Personal accountability, that is the core message of QBQ Inc. That's the only thing we train on, not because other trainings are not important, but because we believe that personal accountability is the foundation from which all other trainings can be built. And that's what I'm here to share with you today, is this idea called the question behind the question. The purpose of this session today is to identify the lousy questions in our lives and begin to remove them, to recognize the danger that they present, and to instead learn how to replace those questions with better questions. And the QBQ is just always a better question. We have to get rid of blame if we want to live an accountable lifestyle. So questions that begin with who and have a whodunit tone that point the finger, we got to get those out of our lives. So those are the three traps. Questions that begin with why lead us to victim thinking. Questions that begin with when lead us to procrastination. And questions that begin with who lead us to blame. So the QBQ helps us eliminate three traps. And the first one is right there on your sheet. Questions that begin with why lead me to victim thinking. That's the V word on your sheet. Victim thinking. Questions like, why is this happening to me? Why doesn't anyone understand me? Why can't we get good people? Why is life so unfair? <coughs> Questions like this lead us to victim thinking because they begin with why and they have a poor me tone. I'm throwing myself a little pity party when I ask these questions all day. And I'm guilty. I am a whiner. Do I have any whiners in the room with me? <laughs> yeah, loud and proud. Oh, we've got some finger pointing over here. <laughs> Question for you. How many of you get up in the mornings and say, today I exist to blame? <laughs> I will run through life writing down all the names of all the people who haven't lived up to my expectations and I will start right here in my kitchen. <laughs> who left the bread and the peanut butter all over the counter? Who didn't clean up the crumbs after making toast? Thank you. <laughs> who left the milk out? Who left the fridge open? Why aren't the dishes put away? Who didn't run the dishwasher last night? Now my routine is totally off for the day because instead of emptying the dishwasher, I have to run the dishwasher. Isn't it amazing how the blame game gets going at the crack of dawn in the morning in our kitchens? And then we get to work and we say, who dropped the ball? Who missed the deadline? Who made the mistake? Who didn't get me that information on time? Who changed that? Who moved my desk? And all, <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> we are wrapped up in what we like to call the company coat of arms. Have you seen the company coat of arms? <laughs> Do you have this at Nationwide Pet? Many, many, many companies and organizations and groups of people. Pretty much if you can find people, there's this, the coat of arms. Those questions that begin with who, those whodunit toned questions lead us to blame and blame costs us an awful lot in our organizations. When I was, I don't know, 16 or 17, we were going on a family drive, and we were driving down 104th Avenue up in Thornton, and this large open field caught our attention. And it caught our attention that day because it was absolutely littered in newspapers. We noticed a man on the side of the road, on the sidewalk, and as we watched, this man tumbled out of his wheelchair and started dragging himself by his elbows across the field, kind of army style. And he's like reaching out and pulling newspapers down to him and catching them and trying to carry them as he dragged himself. So all of us kids yelled, Mom, Dad, stop the car. We have to help him. We can't just let him do that by himself out in the field. So my parents pulled over and then parked the car and we all jumped out and all of us Miller kids had a blast, expending energy, running around the field, literally plucking newspapers out of the sky, cleaning up hundreds of pieces of newspaper. And when we were finished, uh, we loaded it all back into his pickup truck and we helped the man back into his wheelchair because he had, of course, insisted on continuing to help. We asked him what his name was and what had happened. Well, it turns out his name was Brian and he'd been in a car accident a number of years back and had lost his ability to walk. But he could drive. So his job was delivering newspapers. And he'd finished up his route for the day and gotten back home and realized that he'd lost a bundle of papers out of the back of his pickup truck. 
And so, in what I think is an incredible act of accountability, he went out to look for the missing newspapers. Now, I have to be honest, if I had had his disability, I, I really probably would have said, oh, well, someone else can clean it up, it'll be okay, not a big deal, it's just newspapers. But he didn't do that, he didn't make excuses, he didn't ask anyone for help, he just went out and started to get the job done. And so my dad looked at him and said, well, Brian, I don't understand. <laughs> What were you going to do? Were you going to do it all yourself? And Brian just looked at my dad as if there was no other answer. And he said, well, of course. It was my mess. It's my mess. Of course I'm going to clean it up. It's my mess. And I've always loved that phrase. I remember that day so clearly because it struck me that that phrase, well, it's my mess, is such a statement of ownership. And it's a phrase that we can use in our own lives. Whether I created the mess or not, Sometimes it's up to me to solve it. And when I say, well, it's my mess, that's just a way of taking ownership. My relationships aren't what I want them to be. It's my mess. My team is not gelling the way that I wish it would at work. It's my mess. My life isn't turning out the way I thought it would. It's my mess. And when I say it's my mess, it's just another way of saying I own it. I own my relationships, and it's up to me to change myself and fix my relationships to the best of my ability. I own my results at work and my ability to help my team function well, so what can I do to facilitate that teamwork? I own the path and the direction of my life, and if I don't like the way my life is going, there's no one who can change that but me. I own it. That's personal accountability. It's really just as simple as saying, I own it. What can I do to help? How can I go above and beyond and provide exceptional service for you right now? Dorothy works at Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is a fast food restaurant, and one Saturday afternoon, a soccer team from a high school came through on their way to a soccer tournament. So they stopped to eat lunch at Dorothy's store. A young player named Catherine and all of her friends were eating lunch and enjoying their time together when the coach came by and said, okay, girls, it's time to get moving. We need to get on the bus and get to our game. So Catherine and her friends gathered all their trash, threw it away, and raced each other to the bus. It wasn't until they were a little ways down the highway that Catherine realized what she'd done. She could not believe she had done this again. She felt awful, and she did not want to tell her mom. She had lost her retainer, and she'd done this before, and she did not want to let her mom know that she'd done it again. But she did the right thing. She called her mom, and her mom, of course, responded with, well, honey, that's frustrating. I'm disappointed in you, but I know you can't do anything about it right now, so I will call Chick-fil-A and see if we can find the missing retainer. So Catherine's mom calls Chick-fil-A, and Dorothy answers the phone. Thank you for calling Chick-fil-A. This is Dorothy. How can I help you today? So Catherine's mom goes on to explain about the retainer and asks if Dorothy wouldn't mind checking around the store for it. Dorothy says, my pleasure. I can do that. So she puts the phone on hold, checks around the store, asks her fellow coworkers, but no one has found the missing retainer. So Catherine's mom says, well, thank you for doing that. Would you mind setting aside the trash bags for me? I'd like to come down and look through the trash. It's likely that she threw it away, and I just can't afford to replace another retainer. These things are expensive. So Dorothy says, sure, I can do that, my pleasure. You know what, ma'am? Why don't I dig through the trash for you and call you if I find the missing retainer. That way it'll save you a trip, just in case it's not there. Okay, hold up. How many of you would offer to dig through fast food trash for some girl's retainer? <laughs> nope, not gonna happen, right? I don't know many people who would offer to dig through fast food trash for a mouthpiece. And that's disgusting, right? But Dorothy offered. Catherine's mom said, oh no, dear, you don't need to do that. Aren't you so sweet for offering? I'll come down and do the dirty work myself. Just set aside the trash bags from the lunch hour and I'll look through them. So Catherine's mom drives down to Chick-fil-A and she walks into the store. She asks for Dorothy and what does she find but Dorothy up to her elbows in fast food trash, digging, looking for the missing retainer. And she's smiling. Can you imagine being so happy to serve? <laughs> she's digging through ketchup and french fries and shake and chicken bits, looking for a retainer and she's smiling. Now, I don't know how you've been picturing Dorothy this whole time, but she was 16. Now, I know the name Dorothy, you don't think 16-year-olds, but that was her name, and she was 16, and she was smiling as she dug through fast food trash. Can you imagine being so happy to serve? Now, they did find the missing retainer that day, but that's not the point of this story. There's a lot of lousy questions Dorothy could have been asking herself that day. Questions like, who put me on this shift? Why did I have to be the one to answer the phone? 
Why are customers so demanding? And of course, when are those teenagers going to keep their retainers in their mouths? <laughs> that would be my question. But I can imagine, I can assume, based on Dorothy's actions that day, that she was asking better questions. Questions like, what can I do to serve? How can I go above and beyond? What can I do to add value in this woman's life right now? And when we ask questions like that, then we're in a place where we can offer true service to another individual. Remember, our definition of service is doing something for another that I don't have to do. Doing something for another that I don't have to do. Now, I have to be really honest with you. I can be pretty selfish, and I will often offer to do what I know is the extra mile thing to do, but I'm hoping and I'm praying that the person <laughs> says, oh no dear, aren't you sweet? You don't have to do that. Because then see, I offered to do what I know is the right thing to do, but I was let off the hook. I didn't actually have to dig through fast food trash for a missing retainer. Here's the difference between Dorothy and me. Dorothy offered to go the extra mile, she was let off the hook, but she chose to do it anyway. That is service.